realistically very live, and uh, they don't look very rehearsed or um, uh, held back. I was speaking earlier about the negative photography, and again, this is a film noir staple where all three men in the shot are completely black silhouette, and yet the entire frame looks black as it's just a, a cadence of grays, dark blacks, light blacks, hardly any white. You don't. You can't even see where the actual light lighting this is coming from. We have long shadows cast. It's sinister. And the fact that they slowly walk towards him adds to their sinisterness. And it's also interesting. This is photographed on a tripod, with just simple pans and tilts. There's no real choppy editing. Uh, it's played out almost in real time. Therefore, it's all in the photography. It's not about creating the scene in the editing room. And there is one thing that's always puzzled me, though, is that they kill the manager-promoter guy They walk away, and then all of a sudden they run back and take his wallet to make it perhaps look like a robbery. Very strange. Personally, that didn't. Need, I don't think that needed to be filmed. That's thirty seconds of film. Didn't need to do right there. come back to Davy narrating in the train station. So again, realize that the entire film from the very beginning is Davy telling this story while reflecting on the train tracks. Everything here has already happened, and he's telling it to us, yet you don't know if he's cutting out information or leaving it or not. Note to please feed the fish. It's interesting. All throughout Kubrick film, they have, Kubrick films, they have these tiny insert shots of uh, words written on pieces of paper. I can always remember the bottle of serum in Clockwork Orange, Serum 114. <laughs> Where they all work and no play. Good job by the uh, production design, if you can call it that, in this film. Um, obviously, this is a location, this uh, staircase, but uh, I believe the apartments were probably a set, and yet they match very well and look very realistic. They're worn out and tired. So it's, I guess, what they would call magic hour at this time, or uh, sometime in the early morning, just between uh, or before sunrise. I would add a word here on the score in that um, it's sort of a minimalist score. It is, I wouldn't say derivative, it's normal or typical of um, film noir or 50 scores. It was a man named Gerald Freed, friend of Kubrick's, who did some of his early films. But when he came into the apartment and found Gloria missing, you know, in most films there would have been a very bombastic note, you know, da -da -da -da, or something Hitchcockian and a. Um, a push in on, on Davy's face, but uh, again, we're seeing some people might say it's just an early, inexperienced Kubrick not knowing. I dare say it's his innate filmmaking ability that's allowing him to be restrained in that way, not showing everything.
Yet we are completely convinced because we know that Davy is telling us this whole story on the train tracks and yet here are the cops looking in his apartment because they're suspecting him of killing the manager. Um, and so we're already starting to think, okay, there's going to be a pursuit or you know, they're going to try to hound him or chase him and find him. But yet in our minds we should know, okay, he got through that because he's at the train station. <laughs> It's the beauty of film uh, to be able to convince someone of that, despite the information that you know, how what you can't put together in the moment versus um, how you would probably look at it in, in reality. This is a very unique handgun that Davy had. I read something on a message board saying that Rapallo has two different cars and so that that's a continuity error uh, I disagree I think he just has two cars <laughs> you know I mean he's he's not a big big time gangster but he is a gangster with some money I could easily see him having two different cars um, if not for self-protection then just for convenience sake or otherwise and another element of the film noir tendency or leaning in this film, Davy is playing detective here, getting in the taxi cab to follow Rapallo, uh, so they can sneak up on him and get him in the car. And this is early morning. We sense the loneliness of the city. Dark, quiet alley, cobble streets. It was an interesting play in terms of the shot there that you didn't see Davy get out of the cab, walk towards the car with the gun or anything. You just saw it all played on Rapallo's face in reaction. Very convincing. And I like this reverse shot from behind uh, with Davy pointing the gun and then it comes up here. Rapallo is very convincing here. Yeah. Well filmed. So now they're going to go to the uh, hideout where they have Gloria being held. And I don't know exactly what the heck Rapallo's plan was. I mean, did he think that Davy was just going to get arrested and then what's he going to do with Gloria? But uh, it would probably go to show that he's done this before. I mean, somebody who has a lair or a hangout for kidnapped victims has probably done it in the past. This is a real street, this is not a set. And again, this is the kind of stuff you can get for free. This is no set decorating, this is a real street, so the decay of the concrete, the dirty conditions, the darkness in terms of the lighting, it's all real, it's free. <laughs> I will say that there is one uh, criticism I would have of the film that um, in these moments here of this hangout, even though it has this cool elevator, um, which you only see in movies, I've never seen elevators like this in real life ever, but uh, that's another story, um, that there's not that much tension built here. I don't know if it's because the photography is too simple and there aren't enough close-ups, uh, if there's no score. I'm not too sure, but I never really found too much tension in this scene. I knew just from knowing films that obviously they're going to get the goods on him and end up chasing him. It never works out that way in film. But just once I would like to see a film where a guy comes in with a gun, gets the girl, walks away, boom, that's it. No, <laughs> no circumstances, no dropping of anything, but... God, and they even have Gloria tied up, too. Jeez. See, it's hard for me to think that Rapallo would even think about killing Gloria. So, I don't know what he was intending. Very interesting. To try to get into that psychology, because I know a lot of people would say, oh, it's just a simple film, and you're trying to penetrate it or analyze it too deeply, but no, this is a Kubrick film, and like I say, there are 
multi-layered ambiguities, meanings, metaphors, symbolisms. This is the oldest trick in the film book, though. You know, the guy, he's trying to get the girl untied. He can't, so he's got to get one of the bad guys to untie her. That gives them a sort of a, a leg up or a, a chance to ambush him, and boom, they are. He's going to throw the cards. Some good handheld chore <laughs> choreographed violence here. Wow, I forgot that he pulled her hair and bit her on the neck. Jeez, these guys are a little more fierce than the film is portraying them as. You know, and maybe it's just the henchmen are more fierce, but. Oh, interesting. So they knocked Davy out, now they're going to take Gloria uh, away. I can't understand what was going to happen here. Oh, and this is also what I want to note. In terms of her acting, this is really good acting here. The dialogue might not be great. And another beautiful shot here, this tight close-up of Rapallo with the overhead light in the back, just lighting one half of his face with one of his eyes covered. And the highlights of his and her face and hair, the sort of the fuzzy stuff. But great acting on her part. The dialogue might be not well written, but she does maintain this ability to try to convince him to turn over and maybe it's that she's not a great actress in reality but she can be a great actress in the film if you understand where I'm going with that and also at the time in 1955 this hadn't become a complete uh, film convention yet the girl sort of trying to convince the bad guy uh, that she really wanted to go with him the whole time. This hadn't been done a lot in films at this time, so it wasn't a genre convention or the kind of thing where you'd roll your eyes. Nowadays, you're kind of like, oh my god, you know, how? why would he buy that? Why would she try that? I've seen it a thousand times, but at that time it was relatively unique. Very convenient timing for Davy to wake up just at the end of their argument when uh, she's going to do something, or he's just about to do something with her. And this is a very great stunt. I mean, jumping two stories out of a window. And I believe it was done with a stunt double doing the jump. Yeah, remember, see there, the black socks he's wearing, he jumps out the window, lands, and he's wearing white socks. Hmm... And that could have been a stunt double, because you didn't see his face. I wish more had happened in this loft or lair type thing, because it's really coolly lit, and it's the type of place that noirs usually happen in. This, this is also a good touch here, because in this shot you're seeing he's not a superhero. Like, he doesn't just jump out a two-story window and start running down the street comfortably, you know, like an athlete. You know, he's, he's stumbling, he's got some bruises and some cuts and scrapes in this. So apparently the entire film was based on the idea of saying, let's do a, like a ten minute chase sequence and then we'll write a film around it. Because if we have a great chase sequence, um, that'll make for a great film. At the time you had the idea of cheapies. I gotta say again, the photography here on these low angles in these concrete canyons in the city, they just dwarf Davy. They talk about the darkness and the drabness and the falling apartness of this city that he's in and also that he's completely lost, you know. Everything's locked, there are dead ends, no open doors, there are no other people. And I like the handmade touch, the sort of the student, independent filmmaking quality to it. And it's actually a brilliant idea. Forget about the character in the film, outside of the film as a screenwriter. Okay, so you have a character who's being chased in these dead-end streets and alleyways where he doesn't know where he's going. What better thing he could do than to get up onto the rooftops? Where he has a better view, he can see what's going on. That was hilarious, the fact that he throws a, a two-by-four from the top of the building down at them. 
Oh my god. I mean, you can really tell, like, this is inventive, um, 